friends, a while ago I made a video about some spooky Nancy Drew game theories which, as the vendor in Danger by Design would say, seem to tickle the fancy. And I'm never saying that again. Anyway, people seem to like it and I came upon a few other theories while researching for that video which didn't quite fit with the theme, so here I am making a part two. Don't worry those of you who thrive on darkness, I do have a part three in mind with some more dark fan theories which I'm also working on. In the meantime, think of this as a Nancy Drew theory palette cleanser. I present to you four juicy Nancy Drew fan theories which make the games even more entertaining. This video will contain spoilers for Danger by Design, Secret of the Old Clock, Curse of Blackmore Manor, Haunting of Castle Malloy. Theory number one, Sunny and Minette. Sunny June is a recurring character in the Nancy Drew series, infamous for being unable to hold a job and also for being an utter disappointment when he finally appeared in person in The Shattered Medallion. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Let's go back to a time when The Shattered Medallion wasn't even a glimmer in her interactive's eye. Danger by Design was the second Nancy Drew game to mention Sunny June after Secret of the Scarlet Hand. Nancy arrives at her new job at Minette's House of Design to find that Sunny previously held her position and created a relentlessly chaotic work environment by leaving behind a multitude of notes, doodles, and cocoa Kringle wrappers. However, as Reddit user My Boyfriend's Purse suggests, Sunny's impact might have been even more chaotic than what is immediately obvious. At the end of the game, Nancy unmasks Minette and discovers that Minette suddenly started wearing a face mask, not for aesthetic reasons, but because she got a gaudy face tattoo of an alien, presumably during a night of drunken debauchery, but as the game is rated E, it doesn't confirm that. As my boyfriend's purse points out, there is no evidence that Minette is into aliens. She's no X-File. But you know someone who is into aliens? Sunny June. So perhaps Minette's tattoo was influenced by Sunny. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't let just anyone convince me to get a tattoo. You probably already see where this is going. What if... Sonny and Minette were lovers? Wow, that guy gets around. I like to imagine Sonny got a matching tattoo, just somewhere not as visible as his face. This theory actually explains a lot of potential plot holes and mysteries in Danger by Design. We have to ask ourselves, how did Sonny manage to get a position at Minette's? Surely not because of his stellar professional references or sensational fashion sense. Like, where did he get that shirt? A Doctor Who Hot Topic collab? Therefore, we must consider the possibility that Minette hired Sonny because of his other assets. This theory also more adequately explains why Minette broke up with Dieter. The game asks you to believe that she broke up with him simply due to stress, but that excuse seems as thin as JJ Ling's famous mint cookies. What if instead, Minette was secretly cheating on Dieter with Sonny? The face tattoo would make it impossible to hide the affair any longer, forcing Minette to call things off with Dieter before he found out. Not only that, but it would probably cause her to break things off with Sunny as well. The blatant location of the tattoo and the fact that Minette undoubtedly doesn't consider it rude in the cold light of day, hence the mask, probably leads her to resent Sunny and his chaotic presence in her life. Minette, as we know from her extremely particular tea and inspirational object specifications, requires a high degree of control over her life, and that tattoo is proof for Minette that Sunny doesn't fit into that level of control. So she hurriedly breaks up with Sunny and fires him, without even giving him a chance to clear out his desk. Honestly, this theory is so solid that I am fully convinced this is canon. What I wouldn't give to have been a fly on the wall at that tattoo parlor. Theory number two. Nancy's Dollhouse. Secret of the Old Clock stands out among the Nancy Drew games as it's set in the 1930s, while all the other games take place in the modern day. The year, 1930. The place, the road to Titusville, where we find Nancy Drew behind the wheel of her blue roadster, pondering this question. Why did Emily Crandall, a girl whom Nancy knows only through their mutual friend Helen Corning, ask Nancy to drive all the way out to the Lilac Inn to see her. Fans have tried to find a canon explanation for this game for years, but to no avail. Before now. 
well, before April 28th, 2020, which is when Henrik van der Sloon made a post on Tumblr outlining this theory. They captured a split-second screenshot from the very start of The Silent Spy, when Nancy is in the midst of a childhood flashback. The screenshot shows a dollhouse on the floor of Nancy's bedroom, with a toy car sitting beside it. If you look closer, you might realize that the house is identical to Lilac Inn in Secret of the Old Clock, and the car is a perfect likeness of Nancy's classic blue roadster, as seen in the original books. Henrik van der Swoon notes, The Secret of the Old Clock was Nancy's first mystery in the books, but what if it was Nancy's first mystery in the games as well? because she made it all up when she was a child. Looking at it from this angle, Secret of the Old Clock occurs entirely within the imagination of little Nancy, a girl already enthralled by mystery and the idea of being a detective. Nancy Drew is about to get her first taste of the mystery, intrigue, and adventure that are to become her destiny. This explains the inconsistencies with the timeline and a lot of the peculiarities within the game itself. I always thought that mini golf course was a little advanced for the 1930s. It also explains the references to other fictional universes, such as Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm and Friday the 13th. My name's Rebecca, and I'm only 10, but I'll deliver it to her for you, I promise. I won't let you down or double cross you or anything like that. Well, okay. But why the 1930s, you're probably asking? Well, I have a few ideas. A. I'm not American, so I can't say for sure, but I imagine Nancy probably learned about the Great Depression in elementary school, possibly at the time when she was creating this whole scenario in her mind, so the facts and the time period were fresh. B. A series of books akin to the Nancy Drew series exists in Nancy's universe, and she read these books as a child. In the attic in Message and Haunted Mansion, you can read a book called The Mysterious Storybook, which to me feels like an obvious homage to the Nancy Drew books. The protagonist is called Carolyn, like Carolyn Keene, the collective pseudonym for the ghostwriters of the Nancy Drew books. In the very first line, she's described as pushing back her auburn hair, and if you've read the older books, you know a lot of emphasis is placed upon Nancy's Titian hair, which is just a fancy way of saying auburn. Furthermore, the prose reads exactly like a classic Nancy Drew book. I can easily imagine young Nancy taking inspiration from the mysterious storybook and picturing herself in similar mysterious situations, as I did the same thing with the Nancy Drew books when I was a kid. C. Fact. Kids love history. Evidence. American Girl Dolls. Also the Dear Canada and Dear America book series. I rest my case. I adore this theory because it's lovely to think about Nancy as a child, dreaming about solving mysteries and having adventures, and then as an 18 year old getting to live out her childhood fantasy. And again, this theory makes sense. It's the most plausible explanation of Secret of the Old Clock's time period that I've seen to date. Although I do wonder why so much of Nancy's inner fantasy involves delivering telegrams. Did you deliver that telegram? I sure did. Good for you, here's your money. And here's your next telegram. Theory number three, Hugh Penvalin sucks. If you have heretofore ignored the spoiler warning and have never played Curse of Blackmore Manor, this is your final warning. I'm about to spoil the whole game. So presuming that everyone still here has played the game, I probably don't need to tell you that the end of the game reveals that 12-year-old Jane Penvalin is the culprit. Jane gaslights her stepmother Linda into thinking she's a werewolf because Jane is upset that her parents got divorced and wants them to get back together. This established there's a certain dramatic irony to the next fan theory. So the whole premise of Blackmore Manor is that Linda is unwell, scared, and depressed, and instead of sending a medical professional or, you know, actually being there for his new wife, Hugh Penvalin sends an unpaid teenage detective instead. Not a good look, Hugh. So we've established that Hugh is about as reliable a husband as Nancy is a girlfriend. The purported reason that he can't be there for Linda himself is that he's in Rome on a business trip. But there's enough evidence in the game to make even a junior detective like myself suspect this might not be the whole truth. Nancy can learn from Jane that her biological mother, Renee, is an opera singer who lives in Paris. However, you can find a postcard in Jane's room that suggests Renee is also in Rome.
Love, Mom. Looks like Jane's real mother is in Italy, just like her father. You can actually call Hugh and ask him about this weird concurrence of events, but he brushes Nancy off, stating that Rome is a big city. Did you know that Jane's mother is in Rome? Renee is in Rome too? I knew she was traveling, but she neglected to tell me her itinerary. Fortunately, it's a big city, but thank you for the warning. Well, that's an even bigger coincidence, Hugh. I'm not very convinced by his dismissal of the situation. There's a very distinct possibility that he was having an affair with his ex-wife, making Jane's elaborate and evil plan basically pointless, as her parents already are back together. If this were true, it would go a long way to explaining why Hugh lets Jane off so easily at the end of Blackmore Manor. He's motivated by guilt, and he actually doesn't care about Linda that much. I have to wonder, where did Jane learn her gaslighting ways? Actually, it was probably Ethel. Never mind. Theory number four, Matt and Kyler. This last theory is less of a theory and more of a prediction, but it's still based on a lot of hard evidence. As you might have already guessed from my incredibly imaginative name for this theory, I'm going to be talking about Matt and Kyler from Haunting of Castle Malloy and how their marriage is doomed to fail. Before the game even begins, we learn that Matt and Kyler are engaged, and that Nancy has been invited to be Kyler's maid of honor on the basis that Kyler stayed with Nancy's family as an exchange student multiple years before. Already, I'm getting some major red flags. Nancy barely knows Kyler. She stayed with Nancy presumably for a couple weeks multiple years ago, and Nancy hasn't seen her since. And she's not just asking Nancy to be her bridesmaid, she's asking Nancy to be her maid of honor, the most important role in the bridal party after the bride herself. There's something very wrong here. Even Nancy admits she's reluctant to accept Kyler's offer based on their tenuous connection. And this is Nancy Drew we're talking about, the girl who thinks it's socially acceptable to repeatedly ask people about their dead parents at every opportunity. She's not exactly the most socially conscious. When Kyler Mallory called me from her home in London and asked me to be her maid of honor, I was a little reluctant. After all, I hadn't seen her since she stayed with us as an exchange student a couple of years ago. But when she told me the wedding is going to take place at an old family castle in Ireland, <laughs> how could I say no? Isn't there literally anyone else Kyler could ask? Unless none of her friends approved of the marriage and refused to be involved. And I can honestly see why, as Matt appears to be perhaps even more insensitive than Nancy, which is truly saying something. It's just that for Matt, marriage is way too much, way too soon. The only other member of the wedding party present at Castle Malloy is Kit, Matt's best friend, who also happens to be Kyler's ex-boyfriend, and also, also, happens to still have feelings for her. Matt originally asked Kit to be his best man, but Kit refused for obvious reasons. So now Matt's best man is a person that he barely knows and who doesn't really like him. I'm guessing that Matt and Kit probably have a mutual friend group, and I'm also guessing that the friend group is more loyal to Kit, and that's why Matt had to resort to asking one of his snobby co-workers to be his best man instead of someone he's actually close to. At this point, just elope. The fact that Matt would even invite Kit to the wedding in the first place is incredibly inconsiderate. Empathy? What's that? Like, just stick the dagger in and twist, why don't you? The more you look at the circumstances of their wedding, the more red flags pop up, both regarding their relationship and the two of them as individuals. I'd be surprised if their marriage lasted longer than Nancy's closing letter. Their relationship is so tempestuous, it scares him. And those are all the theories I have for you today. If you enjoyed this and want to see more Nancy Drew content, please subscribe. Comment below your favorite Nancy Drew theory or your favorite doomed relationship from the Nancy Drew games. And like if this video tickled the fancy.